Hey friends, it's Miss Patty here at the Art Circle Library. And guess what? One of our favorite performers is back again. And he is bringing us today some wonderful wildlife. We don't know what it is yet because, well, he's not mentioned what all is in the containers behind me. And there's things under the table too. So you'll just have to watch and see what happens and I, I think we'll have a good time. I know we'll have a good time, but you need to keep reading. We've got a lot of books about animals in our part of the library. So keep reading, watch, and here is Mr. Bob. So shake your hands in the air real high and then clap them together and make lots of noise wherever you are. And here's Mr. Bob, yay. All right, thank you friends. This is Bob Tartar with Animology. I'm sorry we couldn't see you in person this year, but we do need to be safe. If you have ever seen me give a wildlife program before, you know we're gonna have a good time. Now, if you have been observant, or if you have signed up for your summer reading program, if you haven't yet, make sure you come down and visit Miss Patty and everybody here and sign up for your summer reading program. The theme to this year's summer reading program is tales and tales. And what we have to remember is tales is one of those words that can be spelled two different ways and have two different meanings. When you come to the library, you can be surrounded by tales, all those stories and all those books and adventures. And then we have animals that have tails, and that's what our program is today. My program with animology is going to be our tails will tell our tale. So what we're going to discuss is how our animals are going to be able to use their tails to survive in the wild. So I want to make sure you all have a wonderful summer reading program here. If you can't find the answers in one of my programs, make sure you come to the library. Miss Patty will help you find a book. If you can't find the right book, you can always meet me online and ask your questions that way. So parents, again, if you enjoyed the summer reading program here with the Art Circle Public Library, make sure you continue to support the public library that make it possible for someone like me to come and visit you, albeit it is virtual this year, but we hope to be back to normal as soon as possible. So again, this is Bob Tarter with Animology with Our Tales Will Tell Our Tale Summer Reading Program 2021. Did you turn on your phone yet? Yeah. Okay, good. Just checking on you, making sure you're on your toes. <laughs> now, friends, our first animal we're going to get out today is a very interesting creature. He's one of our animals that I've only had for a little over a month and he's been learning how to be one of our animology programming creatures during this time. But he has a very cool story of how he came to live with me, much less what his story or tale is in the wild. And that's where we're gonna get out our first little exhibit for you today. With our first little animal, I want everybody to meet Picasso. Picasso is a very interesting little lizard, don't you think? And when we look at Picasso here, this is actually the veiled chameleon not Vail. I am not from the South. I am from the Midwest. I am not a Yankee. But down here in the South, you people don't know how to use words properly. Santa Fe versus Santa Fe. Saline versus Saline. The worst one is Natchitoches. Natchitoches, Louisiana, spelled exactly the same way in Texas, is called Natchitoches. Now what we have right here is Picasso. This is our veiled chameleon and he gets that name because of the way he has that large little sail on the top of his head. Now one of the coolest things about Picasso here, I think are gonna be his eyeballs. You can see how his eyeballs can spin all the way around inside his head. And that's gonna tell you what kind of consumer we're looking at right here. This is an animal that is going to eat things you do not wanna be around. He likes to eat bugs and he eats only bugs. If you eat a diet of only bugs, first word of the day, ears open, insectivore. And those eyes can help spin around to be able to find those bugs. Now Picasso, like I said, is still kind of new to us and he's doing quite well during the program, but I haven't got him to the level of comfort that I want to. So I always keep him on this little stick here to make him calm. But what you have to understand about Picasso, hopefully by the school year, when we go back to normal, we'll use him in our programs. How cool of a program do you think it would be if we could put a cricket on Miss Patty's forehead and take him this close oh, yeah. and the tongue shoots out of his body and grabs that cricket off of her forehead? Quality wildlife programming. His tongue can already shoot out of his mouth over 10 inches. And this guy's not even full grown. The veiled chameleon is actually the largest species of chameleon on the planet. 
Now he has those eyeballs that can spin all the way around. He has these very interesting feet, and if you see, he can move and grasp and hold on to it. He has two toes on one side, three toes on the other, and that's what makes that little hand or paddle to be able to hold on so that he can always stay on the top side of the stick. It's interesting like that, but when we look at that little tail, notice how that tail can grasp and hold on. What we're looking at there is when we have a body appendage looking like the hand or acts like a hand of another animal. That is called prehensile. He can grasp and hold on with that tail. Our native animal that can do that is the Virginia possum. And for any of the mothers that are tuning in, when you think about reincarnation, do not look past being a possum. Because when a possum gives birth, she gives birth to 30 babies at one time. Labor is so intensive, they sleep during the entire process. Some of you are thinking about it now. It is actually the most toothed mammal in North America and is the only marsupial we have here. Now, Picasso has an interesting tail that grasps and hold on. That's at prehensile. But he is also one of our creatures that has an interesting tale or story of how he came to live with me. Picasso was actually a wild capture in the state of Florida. Now, we're not supposed to have chameleons in North America. So you're thinking, Mr. Bob, how did this happen? A warehouse knocked down during a hurricane, thousands of these animals escaped in the wild. With even only a 1.5% chance of survival, these animals have survived and reproducing on their own now. So he's actually a wild capture in the state of Florida. Now normally when we capture something that's not supposed to be there, we will euphanize or cull the animal. But because he could be used as a programming exhibit, we ran him through an anti-parasitic program and now he gets to spend the rest of his life with me as a programming creature for us. And his body size will double. From nose down here to where the tail starts, he will be 12 to 14 inches in length. That's not even counting the tail. So it's the largest chameleon species. Now, if I continue to make Picasso a little upset, he will make his body look bigger and he will start changing his colors, looking brighter. And this is when our animals put on what is called the war paint. Males don't typically blend into the background nearly as much because they like to look pretty and being pretty gets the attention of the females. And what he will do is he will put that war paint on to scare other animals as well as to get the attention of females. And that's where he has that ability to change his color. If you see on this side, he's added a lot more white on him since we've been out. If we were outside in the natural light and I continue to make him a little upset, he will start turning yellow, orange, and red and looking very vibrant for us. So what is also important about Picasso, thinking about him living in Florida, next two vocabulary words, exotic and invasive. Exotic is used to describe something that's not supposed to be here. It's come from a foreign land. For you to best understand and learn the term invasive, the greatest way I can teach you to do, friends, raise your hand if you have a little brother or sister. Raise your hand if you can remember a time before you had this younger brother or sister. Was it a happier time? Yes, it was. Miss Patty agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Little siblings are invasive creatures. They take things from you. And that's what Picasso was. He's an exotic, invasive, insectivore lizard that is now found in Florida with that prehensile tail that he will use to hold on for him. Now, these guys will do very well as a classroom, household, or library pet. You just do need to have high humidity environment for them. And if you were here in the library today, you would agree with me that the humidity is about 70 degrees. That's why my hair is as frizzy as Miss Patty's. That humidity is important for them to be happy and healthy for us. So in with us, he survives on a diet of crickets that we dust with vitamins, as well as you can also feed them earthworms. It's actually a lot of fun to feed them earthworms. They grab a hold of it and then they suck in it like a big old spaghetti noodle. So that was our insectivore, prehensile tail, exotic invasive here in North America, the veiled chameleon. Now we're gonna get out the next exhibit. So with our next exhibit, we always want to remember our animals know how to act as long as you act properly. Even though you're in our virtual world right now, I want everybody to remember good behavior, whether you're there or you're here with me. We always want to be nice and quiet to see our exhibits for us. Now the next one is important because this is an animal that wants to be sleeping during the day and will be awake and active at nighttime. I want you all to meet Molly. Say hi, Molly. Now, if you can look at Molly here, you're looking at a very interesting animal. Molly here is the African pygmy hedgehog. Now, when you think of her, look at that cute little tail she has right there. That cute little black tail. Do you know what that little tail does and helps her with? It helps her poop, because everything is going to poop. 
And that's where you gotta understand the tail makes sure she doesn't have any fecal material stuck on her backside, which is important for us. You get bored, jump on YouTube and watch a hippopotamus have a bowel movement. It looks like it goes through a propeller on a plane. It's really funny. Now, what we have right here is again, one of our nocturnal animals. She's gonna eat the same diet that Picasso would be. She is gonna eat only bugs. This is gonna be our insectivore again. Now the hairs here on her back feel like toothpicks. These are not the quills of a porcupine. The quill of a porcupine is designed to come out of their body and it sticks into yours where this hair here just protects her. Now Molly has been with me for over three years. She is a wonderful programming animal, but the problem with her programming so much is she always does her yoga during the program. Can you not turn into a ball like you're supposed to? Even if I get her tickle spot, I can't even make her get into a little ball. There we go, got that little tickle spot. If she gets scared or nervous, her predator comes out and she turns herself into that little bitty ball and these hairs will be able to stick up and they will protect her for us. Now what you have to understand about the African pygmy hedgehog is this is actually a product of the Roman Empire. These hairs here made it a multi-use animal. The hairs on the back were used to make everything from cardstock to animal training, but the hedgehog itself was a food source. Now you may not want to be eating bugs, but eating something that eats bugs is a lot more palatable for us. These were issued as part of the daily rations for a Roman foot soldier. You would be given a hedgehog, you could throw it in a fire when the hair was burned off, dinner was done. So that's where you got to understand they are an important animal to learn about how we live with the environment. Now hedgehogs are also important now because they are what we call a sight indicator. It is an animal in the wild that serves as a report card to the world around us. And in England, in Europe, they're not doing very well. Overuse of pesticides, habitat fragmentation, degradation laws, the hedgehogs are starting to vanish. And that means we need to live better with our environment, with our wildlife force. Classroom, household, or library pet, Miss Patty. You're looking at something that'll live about five years in captivity. They can live up to eight. I've had one live up to eight. You can feed them a high quality dry cat food and give them bugs for supplements. Or you can actually just feed them the commercially available insectivore diet. It's a lot easier for them. Now this one's Molly. Her twin sister Polly is at home. We're going to get back one of our males that was on loan with one of our teacher friends up in Illinois. And the teacher in his class named the male Don Prickles. The same teacher has a potbelly pig named Kevin Bacon. And if you don't laugh at that, you're not going to like my program anymore. So a nocturnal insectivore that is going to be roaming around the countryside, using that sense of smell, hearing, vision, and touch to be able to find her way. Now we're going to put her up, and the next animal here is going to be one of our creatures that eats only other animals. Meat eater's good. Better word. Think about it. Here's open. Carnivore. Now if I get out of carnivore, we want to make sure everybody maintains that good calm behavior. With this one here, I want you all to meet Randy. Now Randy here is a very cool exhibit for you. This is the Gila monster that is found in the desert southwest. Now he's going to be different from us. If you take two fingers, touch your skin, you're warm. I'm almost sweating in here right now. You feel Randy here? He's actually cold to the touch. He's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. He's only going to be as warm as the environment around allows. The warmer he is, the faster he moves, the more food he can eat. He is our cold-blooded animal. Now our animals have tails, not just this tail, the tail, the story that they can do. Next new word, ears open, niche. And when we look at him, we can theorize his niche job. We got a long bodied lizard that is kind of wide, but he's also kind of thin. He has two eyes near the front part of his head. He has a large olfactory sense, giving him a good sense of smell. You can see his ear right there, giving him a good sense of hearing. But when you watch Randy, He's sticking out his tongue. Why do you think he's sticking out his tongue? What is the purpose for this? You see with your eyes, hear with your ears, smell with your nose, touch your skin, you taste with your tongue. This animal here can taste his tongue, flick it through the air, pulling that scent later particle tongue to the inside of his body. Once it's on the inside of the body, there's a hole in the roof of the mouth called the Jacobson's organ. He sticks his tongue right in there. It's right below the brain and the brain will then process those scent particles and telling him, yep, I taste food right in front of me. So that's why our carnivorous lizards and snakes take their tongue and flip it through the air. Now, I will be honest for you friends. About a month ago, I got a handwritten letter from somebody that got offended during one of my programs. I talk fact, not fiction. If I say something that offends you, I'm sorry, but I don't care. 
sometimes the books have it wrong. There is no such thing as a poisonous snake. Venom is when things get injected into your body. Poison is when things get ingested in your body. There's no such thing as a poisonous snake. You can eat snakes. I have. That offended the vegan during the program. I don't care. What we have to think of here is this animal is a very slow moving, cold blooded animal. He's found living in the desert southwest. He uses that sense of smell, sense of vision, sense of hearing and taste. And in the desert, we may only have a rainfall event once a year and overnight the desert will transform. Flowers will bloom, animals will have babies. And what happens is there's gonna be a ton of life. And that's when this cold blooded, slow moving animal will start walking around and he will find food. In the desert, there's not very many trees, so he will find ground nesting animals. Could be a songbird, a game bird, even a mammal. And this little guy here will walk right into that nest. And the parents protecting that nest will look at each other and go, you know what? We can always make more babies. And the parents will abandon the nest. And he will go in eating all the eggs, all the babies in that nest. He then will convert all the calories from that food that he's just eating into fat and he stores it in his tail. If you could squeeze it, it feels like a raw bratwurst right now. He may only eat or drink once or twice a year and survive 50 weeks on the fat deposits on that tail alone. That's what we find amazing. Now, if I make a mistake and get myself bitten by Randy here, am I gonna die? No, I won't even go to the hospital, but y'all know Mr. Bob's a little odd. If I get bitten by him and the venom leaches into it because it comes from the lower jaw, the teeth on the lower jaw are hollow and the venom gland is right underneath the mandible. If he bites and holds onto it, the venom will leach into my body. Now I'm weird, you know that. And when I was a little bit kid, about six, I saw this really cool video and they took a three quart container of fresh horse blood. They dropped three drops of venom in it. They waited 90 seconds. They then flipped it over and the beaker of blood slid out like a solid jello mold. You know that cranberry sauce you serve at Thanksgiving? Now you're gonna think about us on Turkey Day. That's what his venom will do. It clots the blood. If I get myself bitten by Randy here, the hand and the blood in my hand here will actually turn to pudding, become oxygen deprived. The cells will die and turn black and necrotic and eventually the whole thing will fall off. But what you have to understand, this entire time I don't feel good, but I'm not gonna die because Randy cannot eat me. There's no point to it but he will protect himself from predators because of that venom. And then when I recover, I teach my offspring, do not mess with brightly colored creatures that aren't afraid of you. Now, with his venom here, he is a beneficial beast. The venom from these animals has now been used and synthesized to come up with drugs to help treat diabetes, as well as battlefield dressings for soldiers. If a soldier is bleeding out on a battlefield and you cannot put a tourniquet on it, they now have a bandage that you can slap it on and it'll clot blood saving lives. That's what's so amazing about our wildlife. And all these amazing facts offended the vegan. I don't care. He's a very sweet little boy, aren't you son? Now what you have to understand here is I'm not worried about Randy biting me because when he gets ready to bite, this is as fast as he moves. And if you cannot get yourself out of the way of that, you deserve to get bitten by him. So we have another one of our carnivores that is a beneficial beast, using that tail to store food and water to be able to survive the entire month without it. Now the animals are getting bigger and Miss Patty is getting more nervous because she has no idea what I'm gonna pull out next. Yeah. With this one right here, we always wanna remember our rules. Even if we're virtual, stay seated, stay quiet, save your question. Let's go to work. I want you all to meet Larry. Say hi, Larry. Hi, Larry. When we look at Larry here, we're looking at a very interesting animal. This is the green iguana. Now, what we have to understand is he can teach you that important lesson of niche, what an animal's job is in the wild. When he looks right at the camera, can you see his eyeballs are exactly on the sides of his head? That is telling you his food does not run away from him. For animals that their food doesn't run away, they're gonna eat plant tissue. If you're a consumer of only plant tissue, you are an herbivore. Vegetarian and vegans are confused people. I've never met one I really like. And that one a month ago really confirmed that theory. This guy right here can only eat plant tissue. Those people choose not to eat meat. I don't know how you do it. I couldn't do it. You know what's funny about vegetarians is they even find bacon delicious. But that's interesting. 
Everybody loves bacon. Now, what we have right here is Larry has a very cool body part. You had dirt on your face, I had to clean you off. Now, what we have right here is the green iguana. This guy is a large lizard, but he's not even close to being full grown. When he's full grown, he can be 12 to 14 feet in length. So that is a long body lizard's eyes on the side of his head so he doesn't become someone's food. Now when he wakes up in the morning, he's much like me. I wake up in the morning, I gotta have that first cup of coffee to be able to get that second cup of coffee to get my day started. I'm on number four and the second glass of iced tea already. What we have to do is these guys here will wake up and sit in the sun. The sunlight will warm him up and then he'll go out foraging for food. When he goes out foraging for food, he'll fill his abdomen full of that food. And then he climbs as high as he can in the tree canopy, getting that direct solar radiation. And what he will then do is he will absorb those calories. But he has some cool animal adaptations. One of the most unique ones has to deal with the ventral surface, the belly. When you look at that belly right there, look at that pattern. That is what we call it when an animal has a body marking to look like the background. And that looks like light filtering through the tree canopy in the rainforest. But think about the pair of shoes you can make out of it. That offended the vegan too, don't care. When an animal has that mimicry, he can stay hidden from a predator below because he looks like light filtering through the tree canopy. If the predator comes here to the side, when they get close enough to look at that circle, they're gonna pause. That is called Ocellus. That's so when an animal has a body marking to look like the eye of a larger predator. That circle is bigger than my pupil. And so that would be a much larger predator. So what happens is he sits high in the tree, hidden from a predator underneath because of mimicry. Predator comes here to the side, they get spooked by that little circle and the predator will pause. And that's when Larry will make his escape. I've seen these guys 90 feet in the tree canopy, jump straight out of the tree and fall into the ground. The long fingers and toes grab at the vegetation while he falls through the tree canopy. And that way he will be able to grasp and climb back up again. Now one of Larry's coolest animal adaptations, and this is much more important when we're in person because by this point in time in a program, somebody's been having a problem with one of their children. And this cool animal adaptation, every parent wish their child has. Larry actually has a third eye on the top of the head. Right in front of my finger, you can see that little oval shape right there. That is actually a light sensing organ. So if he's high in the tree canopy, he's hidden from predators underneath because of mimicry. He scares predators on the side because of OCLs. If a predator comes over the top of him, he will be alerted by that third eye. But look, when we do indoor programs and Larry's cold and I cover up, what does he do? He falls asleep. Larry. Larry. That light sensing organ right there, whenever it's dark and cold, his brain is telling him to go to sleep. Parents, how many of you wish your child had that right now? You could duct tape a box to their head and take a personal day. Miss Patty agrees with me. She's laughing right off camera because she has those children in story time where you just cover up their head and they go right to sleep for you. If I'm doing an outdoor program and I'm in natural light and I pass my hand over the top of his head, he will actually become aggressive and try and bite me. But when we do the indoor ones and he's cold, he just goes right to sleep. Now you can also see he has the large flap of skin right there, the dewlap. Like Picasso, he will make his body look bigger. That intimidates other males as well as females are always looking for bigger things on the male. So he will throw that out and that will make his body look bigger, giving him the greater chance of sending his genes along. Now while we've had Larry out, you've noticed I've only been holding on to his abdomen. I don't hold on to this tail. This tail right here can be used as two functions. Number one, it can be used as a weapon and it can smack you and you don't want to be around it. If you run your finger down this ridge, is fine. You run your finger against it, it is sharper than a steak knife. And he can smack hard enough to draw blood off of my arms with it. Now, if a predator does catch him, even with the mimicry underneath, Ocellus on the side, third eye on the top of the head, if he grabs a hold of him, Larry, stay awake. If you grab a hold of him, these guys here can actually senesce their tail, meaning they can make their tail fall off. If their tail falls off, they're no longer connected to that central nervous system. It's gonna sit around, flacking around on the floor, squirting blood. Would that get the attention of a predator? Yep, you bet. Predator go after the tail, Larry will be able to run off and survive. Without that tail, he will do just fine. He can regenerate that tissue. If I pull your arm off, you can't grow a new one, but he has the ability to regenerate that tissue. 
Now, like the chameleon, the green iguana is one of our exotic invasives that we have here in Florida. You have dirty skin on your body. I'm just trying to make you look pretty. And this past winter, when it was getting cold in Miami, these large lizards were falling out of the trees, hitting people while they were walking to work. That was cool. But again, if you know anything about Mr. Bob, I love to have fun with my adults. I know this is a children program, but some of you adults are turning in. And think about this. If you've ever traveled to Central or South America, Cozumel, Cancun, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Belize, Ecuador, think about this. Be aware of what you're eating. Chicken on a stick, chicken of the sky, chicken of the tree. You're eating Larry's cousin, Barry. You're sitting there at that swim up bar with that weird little beach hat on, having those umbrella drinks and they bring you that plate of appetizers. Those chicken wings are these hind legs right there. They cut them off, skin them, bread them, and fry them and feed them to us gringos all the time. That really offended the vegan. I don't care. Green iguanas are very common in these tropical areas and they have very little economic value where a chicken has more because a chicken lays eggs and you need eggs for breakfast. So we have an exotic invasive herbivorous lizard that your parents may be eating while they're on holiday and it also falls out of the trees on people in Miami. The large dewlap, ocellus, and mimicry on the bottom and that large tail that can be used as a weapon to protect himself as well as get the attention of a predator when they're trying to grab a hold of them. Now, friends, the animals are getting cooler and cooler. And this next one is certainly one of those. Because with this exhibit here, I have to wear a glove. And think about it, if Mr. Bob wears a glove, that means I can get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. So save your questions, you have your answers to one of mine. You can't raise your hand because they're not here. Miss Patty, I am so old school. I cannot change that. It's okay. Wow, I can't delete that line. If you have any questions, you can always come in and ask Miss Patty and she will answer your questions for you. If she can't answer to you, she will send you to a book or she'll have you email me and I'll get your answers that way. With this one right here, we have a very special one. You'll like this one. There's only two weird librarians in the room right now. Normally the room is full of children. And this one right here, I want all my friends to meet Billy. Say hi, Billy. Hi, Billy. Billy here is a mega bat. Even though he doesn't look like it right now, this guy here has an almost two foot wingspan. That's why we call him Mega. This is the straw colored fruit bat. He gets that name because of that straw colored throat patch you can see right there. But when we look at him, he's an amazing individual. Now, when we think of his niche, his story, his tail, either he's going to look like an upside down chihuahua for you right now, or he looks like a werewolf. But what we have to understand about our fruit bat here is he eats only fruit. He eats things you like to eat. That's not true of every bat. Raise your hand, friends, if you like to eat bananas. Raise your hand if you like to eat watermelon. Dude, you don't like watermelon? How can you not like watermelon? Pineapple? The more exotic fruits, papayas, mangoes, figs, dates, passion root, guava. Good. Seriously, you don't like those? Eh, you're a simple girl, aren't you? Yes, I am. Did you eat your watermelon and spit the seeds out? Come on. No, I don't like watermelon. What is up with you, dude? That is so weird. Know. Friends, do you not like watermelon? Let's have a watermelon party here at the library. <laughs> Billy here is just gonna eat all that fruit. He is our herbivore. This is an herbivorous bat. Now, when we think of his niche, his job, he has that large nose giving him a good sense of smell. And that's gonna help him find that food while he's flying around at nighttime. He has large eyes to see well. Now, some of you are gonna go, Mr. Bob, you said herbivores have their eyes on the side of it. That is true, but if you're an herbivore and you're a pilot, you need to have depth perception. And that's why we have two eyes on the front of our heads. Without that, he'd hit a lot of trees. Now, you can see how his ears are constantly moving, constantly listening as well. Bats are very sociable and they like to be around their own kind. And he will actually land on a tree making lots of happy noises and that alerts all the friendly bats in the area. Now, when we think about our bat here, you're looking at the most numerous type of mammal. We have more bat species on our planet than anything else. Now, this is our herbivore. Our bats here in Tennessee are gonna be insectivores. We have 14 species of bats found here in Tennessee. Now, bats are interesting. They have a very high metabolic rate. They have to eat about two to two and a half times their body weight in food every night. Billy right here is actually one of the most expensive animals I have to feed. He eats a pile of kale about this big, about a half a sweet potato, half an apple, half an orange, and a banana almost every night. He eats more fruits and veggies in one night than I probably eat all week. 
and think about that. If Mr. Bob was a consumer like Billy here, I'd have to eat 500 pounds of food in one night. If I eat 500 pounds of bananas and watermelon, do you think I'd go to the bathroom a lot? Yes. The droppings of a bat is called guano. You like guano and you don't even know it. When a fruit bat goes to the bathroom, the fruit seeds will go through that guano, planting the next generation of trees for us. Over 70% of all the fruit and nut production in the rainforest is made possible by our bats. That's why they're so important to us. Straw colored fruit bat is the most common mega bat that we have in Africa. But when we think about our bats, they're the most numerous type of mammal, but we're still looking at a mammal here. All the other mammals are gonna be gliding. Four characteristics that make mammals mammals. Number one, what is Mr. Bob losing on the top of his head? Hair. I don't care, I'm married, I've given up. I haven't paid for a haircut in probably 15, 17 years. Mammals have to have hair or fur. Billy has a wonderful fur coat. Next characteristic, take two fingers, touch your skin. Are you warm or cold? We are warm blooded. Now, whenever we get hot, we sweat. Now, I know some of your moms are ladies and they don't sweat. Ladies glow, glisten, spritz, sparkle, shimmer, and shine. That started during Dr. Seuss week. I have one more in line. Ooh. See, the librarian's the only one that liked that joke, and that was yeah. the best one. Billy here is going to be more like a dog. Whenever he gets hot, he's going to start panting. So we have hair, warm-blooded. Next one. Did you hatch out of an egg? No. Did your mother cut off a thumb and you grow from that? No. You were all born alive as babies. And even though you're all virtual, when you're all born alive as babies, you'd be a lot cuter to me than you are right now. It's true, babies don't talk back. Children talk back. Now this guy right here, last characteristic of a mammal is we feed our babies milk. And when Billy was a baby, he was born over 12 and a half years ago, you're not allowed to fly around in the library, Miss Patty would have a problem with that. His mother fed him milk and he drank that milk before he could start eating that plant tissue. So the straw colored fruit bat, very interesting mammal. Now our bats here are gonna be eating only bugs. Do mosquitoes weigh very much? No. So our bats have to eat that much more in food. Our bats will eat 2,000 to 3,000 mosquitoes almost any given summer night. Good thing or bad thing? Good thing. Now, y'all, I am not from the South, but I am not a Yankee. I am a Midwesterner. And you do not have a season called winter here. You have a long fall. Where I grew up, we have winter. But even during our winter down here in Tennessee, do we have lots of bugs flying around? No. So bats have to do one of two things. Our bats will have to pick up and move from one location to someplace else. And when our animals do this, that is called migration. Think about that snow we had in February. We could have migrated and been all the way down in Belize having those umbrella drinks. Now, if you do not migrate, the next thing animals do is they are actually going to put on a whole bunch of food and fat on their body. Apparently that's what Mr. Bobby's body is doing to them right now. And that's when an animal will sleep during the season they do not want. That's called hibernation. Now late summer, early fall here in Tennessee, our bats gorge themselves on food. Because it's colder, they're not flying as much. They can eat up to 5,000 mosquitoes a night. Then they put fat on their bodies, then they go find a building or a cave, and they go to sleep. They slow down heart rate, metabolic rate, digestion rate, but the guano will still pile up on the floor. We mine this guano, we extract this guano, we use it in our everyday lives, and maybe in a room with us right now. It's bad, bad, your eyelashes. No, she doesn't have any. Look at any of your mothers around you and have them bat their eyelashes. If they have mascara on, they can have bat poop by their eyeballs. If you pucker lips up, ladies, lip gloss, lipstick. The reason that catches the light is that it's ground up fish scales. The powder on your face so you do not shine is beetle carcasses. Very expensive perfume has whale vomit in it. I don't know why I know this, but knowledge is power and I want you all to have the best of it. Now when we think about this one, during the quarantine, Mr. Bob did a lot of cooking and I cook with butter and potatoes and meat, but I also did a lot of baking. The vanilla extract that I was putting in our baking has the scent glands from skunks in it. That gives you that good full flavor of vanilla. Raise your hand if you like M&Ms. Raise your hand if you like Skittles. That hard candy shell that mounts in your mouth, not in your hand, that is actually the exoskeleton keratin of bugs that holds it together. Again, as you can imagine, this bothered the vegan during the program. Again, I don't care. Now friends, again, I'm very sorry we don't get to see you in person, 
I have one more exhibit for you. And this is one where we usually have to make sure everybody is calm and quiet, but since we're filming here all by ourselves, it shouldn't be a problem as long as Miss Pat doesn't act all crazy and runs around like a child, because this next one will actually think she's food. He's very hungry today. The last animal I have for you is one that I have to wear a glove. Mr. Bob wears a glove, it means I can get hurt. I don't wanna get hurt. Save those questions you have and answer to one of mine, you can raise your hand. This one is, again, one of our newer animals. I've had him since March. He's learning how to be one of our programming creatures. Oh, good boy. With this one right here, I'd like you all to meet Q. And when we look at Q, Q is short for Quentin. Do not try and eat the librarian. She's a very nice person. He's usually used to annoying little child during the program, oh, okay. and that's where the librarian, or yesterday in Franklin, the mother was even gonna donate her child for food. Wow. You don't wanna eat them, they're covered in germs, seriously. Now, when we look at Q right here, does this bird look like he's gonna eat earthworms out of the ground like a robin? Yeah. No. Is he gonna eat bird seed from a feeder? No. Do you think he wants to rip the flesh from your bones and swallow it? Yep. Yes, like a kid on a donut. Or a library assistant that was in the room right before we got started to filming. He loves to eat meat. And that's where we have one of our wonderful carnivores. Now Q here is actually our Buto Buto. It is not spelled butt butt. This is very similar to our red tail hawk that we have here in Tennessee. He is found living in England, Europe, and Asia. Same genus, different species. Too good eyesight that he's gonna be able to see a mouse move at over 100 yards. Flesh tearing beak right there. Large wings that is gonna be able to chase their prey. Friends, you missed it, Miss Patty jumped and she's already off camera. The large wings here are gonna help this animal chase down that prey. Toes that are tipped with talons that grab a hold and kill it, as well as, look at that nice tail fan. The tail is gonna give them the direction to be able to grab that prey. Now we didn't talk about the tail on the fruit bat because fruit bats don't have to worry about their food leaving. Fruit doesn't leave. Our bats here, the insectivores and the other carnivorous bats that we have in the area, is going to be able to use that tail to pursue that prey. And that's what he's gonna do. Now Q is gonna sit in a high elevated position. His eyesight will scan below him. He's an extremely opportunistic eater. I've seen these guys eat everything from bugs. Right now he's eating lots of June bugs. Oh, we can see it in his pellets. Yeah. Maybe we should save the exoskeleton so you can make homemade M&Ms. He will eat small lizards, snakes, mammals, birds. He goes by the name Common Buzzard in England. I do not like that because that offends me. Buzzard is a negative connotation. In our birds of prey, we have eagles, hawks, owls, falcons, and vultures. All of them have a very important niche or story or tale they're supposed to do. Q here in England has been known to eat a lot of game birds. What they do is they put a lot of time, money, and effort in making game birds on these estates so that they can have a big bird hunt. But the problem is this little guy here will sit in an elevated position, fly down and grab a hold of it, and eat their animals because that's what he's meant to do. And you look at his sense of smell, he does not have much of one, and that's where he will also eat carrion. That's a very polite way of saying roadkill or gut pile at a dinner table. Now you can see Q's still kind of new. He still holds his wings out in that mantling behavior. That's when he gets a little nervous. The librarians are not gonna hurt you, I promise. He will open his wings up looking bigger. He can actually fall down and grab a hold of a prey. If he doesn't kill it instantly, he will make his wings into a little dome. It's called a mantling behavior. The tail fan will block that back entrance and then he takes his head and sticks it inside, stabbing that prey until he can kill it and eat it. Because this guy here is a certain carnivore eating only other animals for us. Now Q is different from our other birds of prey that you may have seen here, especially our Eurasian Eagle Owl. L, our Eurasian Eagle Owl, is a human imprint. She's been with me since she's just been 14 days old. This guy here is just over a year of age and he lived with his biological parents on a Comanche reservation in a captive breeding program. We'll get into why that's interesting in a minute. But what we have to think of here is this guy has only been with me since about March. He's gotten a lot better, but he will be able to be used as a multi-use animal for us. We can use him as an educational ambassador like this. We can also use him in falconry. That's when you use a bird of prey to work for you. We could go hawking. If I walk through an area and we chase up a squirrel or a rabbit, I can throw him in the air and he'll fly after and try and attack and kill it for me. Now we have to work on a level of trust. He has to trust me to take that food away 
that I will give him food and shelter every day for his life. Now we will also use him in what is called abatement. Abatement is when you use a bird of prey to deter. Think of an orchard, a vineyard, a landfill, a warehouse. You can have noxious birds coming in, eating the farmer's crops off the vines. You can have birds in a warehouse defecating in boxes. You can have gulls picking up biohazardous materials from a landfill and dropping it in neighborhoods. You can spray chemicals and put up noisemakers. Those will eventually become null and void. If you have a falconer like me and I come and bring my bird, I fly him around, we will be able to chase away that prey species just by the presence of the predator alone. And remember, if we work for a winery, we barter services for products so we don't have to pay taxes. Kids, learn aggressive accounting. That's how you're gonna get through life. Now, our boy Q here is a remarkable one. You can see he looks very similar to our red tail. His new tail feathers, dude, they're not gonna hurt you. His new tail feathers that are coming in because he's molted right there. They're a lot redder than the one-year-old feathers, but it also has that horizontal banding on it that identifies him as the Buto Buto, a broad-winged hawk from Europe, Asia, down into Africa, perch. Now friends, I hope you've enjoyed our virtual 2020 our Tales Will Tell Animology program. If you have any of your questions, remember you can always come to the library and get one of those books to look it up, but you can also find us online. Parents, if you enjoyed our program for your children, even if you didn't watch it, I want you to continue to support your public library as well as your friends of the public library. They make it possible for someone like me to come. For the quirky adults that have tuned in, if you have a good sense of humor and you're a Facebooker, fan the company, and that'll tell you when we're doing public programming in your area, as well as some of you may be able to find us for one of our adult-only virtual evening programs. It is called Tales and Ales, Bob After Dark. And that's where we get to ask some interesting questions that we wouldn't ask in front of the children. So again, friends, I'm very happy to be able to see you, even if it is just virtually. Make sure you have signed up for your summer reading program. We don't wanna have that summer slide where we forget how to do things over the summer because before the summer slide, you had the corona crash. And I want you all to get back into school as soon as possible so we can see each other and learn. So thank you, friends, very much. Have a good, safe summer. Be well, and I will see you in the future. Thank you much. Bye-bye.